Sherman tanks, remembered by their designers for speed and agility, and by their crews for being the right tanks for the wrong war. We were just inadequate. Drop it. Thank you to our sponsor today, Wargaming, and their free-to-play game World of Tanks, a massive online free-to-play warfare strategy game with over 150 million players worldwide. All of the tanks are true-to-life models researched by your favorite Irish giant, with realistic upgrades that can be earned and applied to enhance your tank as you progress, such as some guns that were not actually on some of the tanks, and only existed in blueprints. So you can finally see if the small term would have been better, and depending on how much bias you are fighting, you might be right. The game also contains many maps that change play and strategy, including some alt-history scenarios, so your Weraboo friend can finally see their dream of panzers in London become reality. Take part in joint operations to spot, track, and destroy enemy units by downloading World of Tanks for free down in the description. And use my code TANKTASTIC, still using that one, huh? To unlock a bonus T-127 Soviet bias machine, 500 gold, and 7 days of hot, thick, uh, TANKTASTIC premium time. So, given my record of what a lot of people expect from me, and what a lot of the more recent conversation about American tanks has been made up of, I'm sure you think you already know what this entire video is going to be about. It started off with the joke about how everybody used to think the Shermans were death traps, and I'm going to go through all the cookie cutter facts about why the Sherman was actually good. The 3% mortality rate for crews both in and out of the vehicle, due mostly to the incredible ease involved in exiting the Sherman. The fact that German big cats were rare, and that you can only point out a handful of times that any of the big three were encountered. And end it all with a long rant about how the book that shall not be named serves only as a testament to confirmation bias, and that Belton Cooper was the worst author in history. But I think that intro in this paragraph covers about all of that as much as it needs to be. Because it's been talked to death and followed as many sentences beginning with actually as anyone can count. The one thing that seems to not really be in any of these discussions though, is why the US made the design and implementation of their tanks, specifically the M4, in such a way that it sparks so much controversy. Why were they so slow to implement new designs and changes, and why did they stick with the same vehicles for so long when these supposed shortcomings were so self-evident? If the Germans were coming up with a new model pretty much every year, with all the economic shortages they faced, how come these dumb Yanks couldn't push out something other than the Sherman before the war was pretty much over? The US began its relationship with tanks crewing French FTs in World War I, and created its first one shamelessly ripping it off in the form of the M1917. Various designs were created in the interwar era, culminating with a nice stock of M2 mediums at the outbreak of the war. Although this was more of a mobile pillbox than a tank, as the US was currently in the grips of the cult of the machine gun. Tank development as a whole, however, was never given too much attention, as there was a minor stock market incident that plummeted the 30s into the big sad, and most of the military spending went to the Navy. As war began in Europe, though, the US realized it may be called upon again to sort out Europe's problems, and upon seeing what the Germans had been doing with tanks, realized that they would need a force to counter it, and developments began on the M3 medium tank that was the result of some experiments with a 75mm freedom launcher on the M2. I'll direct you to this video here in the top right corner for more information on the M3, but it was really a stopgap while the long development cycle of the M4 was wrapped up. The M4 Sherman was the tank the US was going to win the war with, featuring a 75mm and a rotating turret, bang, bang, you're dead. sloped armor, a decent speed from its radial engine, and it was well received by the troops serving until the end of the war and even further on into Korea. It was one of only a handful of tanks that served pretty much everywhere, there were also many variants along with the multiple upgrades, albeit they took a while to be implemented, within its career. And although I criticized the Germans for all of their various changes in the production run of their tanks, the massive American industrial base was able to handle these changes incrementally and still pour out the tanks in incredible numbers. Ah, American industry. And it's only at a small point throughout its amazing career that people give it a bad name. In France in 1944, and to a larger extent somewhat in Germany towards the end, they got called death traps because the Germans, who were on the defensive, destroyed a notable number of Shermans with their big penis guns. And that has created a back and forth of Shermans being death traps, even though when you're on the offensive like the Americans were, you typically want a 3 to 1 average, 
and the defenders have a built-in leg up because they can stay in place, hidden behind cover, and shoot first, meaning they will obviously kill more than the exposed attackers. Something that, you know, goes back to ancient history, Sun Tzu even wrote about it, and it's part of Warfare 101, with the Germans even running into this problem during Barbarossa, when they came across actually prepared Soviet AT guns, but yeah, the whole thing's a death trap because when it ran into an ambush, it didn't magically deflect the shells and throw them back at the enemies who fired them. <clears throat> That's the core of the main issue. That the Shermans were too lightly armed and armored, and that they weren't suited to fight the Gen 3 German tanks that the Allied commanders should have known that they would be coming up against in the later war. And that it took way too long for upgrades to the Sherman, and for the Pershing eventually, to come online and give them a fighting chance. And I will admit that, yes, it took the Americans a long time to get new equipment overseas. Hell, it took them a long time just to get the Sherman overseas as they had to use the M3 as a stopgap. But why is this the case? The problem certainly wasn't economical. Although the US was just getting out of a Great Depression, the US economy was the biggest in the world. So big that they could sick their economy on their economy to fix the economy. So that wasn't the issue. But like everyone else, the US did face problems when going to war, and for them it was location. All the ocean between North America and all the fighting putting thousands upon thousands of miles between its troops overseas and its industrial heart. Now, this was overall a good thing because the war wouldn't really touch North America and its civilians and factories were pretty safe. But what it means is that for everything sent out, it cannot easily be returned home for repair. Basically, all upkeep of soldiers, weapons, and most importantly, vehicles has to be basically ready to be done in the field. Where, say, the Germans could send back the Ferdinands to the factory for a complete rework just on the trains, the Americans couldn't do that without it becoming a huge undertaking. So because of that, everything had to be either solidly made or easily repairable in the field or a field depot. And to make that possible, their tanks had to undergo much longer sets of trials to be approved by the armored force that they were going to use. And they had to bring a lot of spare parts. One example of their extreme scrutiny is that, at one point during the Sherman's development, there was a lock washer on the transmission that was going to fail long before any other components would. And it had to be sent back and reworked because even such a small component had to be built up to the standards that they wanted for this thing to run for a long time on foreign soil. The 76mm Sherman was ready in 1942, but it was extremely difficult to fight in and took years of rework for it to finally be approved and allowed to be sent over for fighting for the ergonomics to get good enough for the troops to use it to its best extent. The Pershing began its development much earlier in the war than people really realize, but the early models were so bad that Armored Force didn't want them, and it took a long time before they were convinced that a suitable model had been created. And if you know anything about the Pershing, it still had quite a few problems. So these issues that people complain about that the High Command wasn't thinking far ahead enough and not providing the troops with what they needed isn't true. Oftentimes it was the people who were going to be using the things that said, no, this isn't good enough, we don't want it. And in some cases like D-Day, newer things like 76mm Shermans were available, but commanders on the ground said that their regular Shermans were doing just fine and they didn't see why they would need to retrain their troops on a new tank, which I admit was probably a bit of a mistake. So the genesis of these arguments of the Sherman being a death trap and not being good enough is really out of a misunderstanding of how US R&D worked and the problems the US faced fighting a war so far from home in a way that is arguably the smartest. Not taking gambles on bigger, shinier guns and heavier armor in case the thing is a reliability nightmare. And with the Sherman being as good of a tank as it was, and the points arguing against it being a death trap that I mentioned before, I would say this is easily the right idea. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments below what other countries would be good to cover, even though we're kind of running out of majors at this point. And thank you to World of Tanks for sponsoring this episode. If you're interested, don't forget to join using my link below and my code TANKTASTIC for free stuff. Also, thank you to my patrons on Patreon for allowing me to remain unscathed by the YouTube chaos going on. I know the upload schedule's been a little tenuous over the summer, but um, I'm back to the regular times, and I have a few new series that I'm looking forward to starting. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you very soon. They definitely were through, but this didn't really bother the Soviet tankers. And it's in big part to this huge cultural difference between the West and the East. In the West, quality means something that's going to run forever. And in the East, quality means more something that's easy to repair. Really embracing the fact 